Hey, what's up everybody? I am Aaron from Aaron's Audio Corner and today I'm reviewing the Kef Reference One Meta Bookshelf Speaker. It's a $9,000 repair bookshelf speaker. And I know a lot of you that watch this channel have been wondering lately, man, why are you reviewing more of the costlier stuff? Well, there's a few different reasons, but number one, if I'm given the opportunity to review something that I am personally interested in, I'm going to take that opportunity. And it just so happens that it, it is more costly stuff. Now I do have lower, more budget friendly stuff coming very soon, but for today's video, we're going to focus on this particular speaker and try to understand what makes it so costly. And when I say so costly, let me be clear. I don't have the budget that would allow me to afford such a speaker. So I take the opportunity to review it and to audition it when I can. But to some of you out there who may be watching this video, this, this could be chump change to you. So keep that in mind when I talk about value or cost, it, it's very relative. I think in this particular case, however, when you say, what am I getting for this extra money? For example, say over the R3 line, which I think the Kef R3 bookshelf speaker, which I reviewed, I'll try to drop a card up to it up there. I think it's about 1800 bucks for the pair. So you're nearly four times the cost for this speaker. Why? Well, number one, this incorporates some meta technology, which to me uh, is a lot of engineering tech that if I'm being honest, I just haven't looked into it. I understand basically what it sounds like to me is it's a Helmholtz resonator at the back of the tweeter and captures all of the resonance that would otherwise bleed out back into the diaphragm. And therefore you have a more clean sound. If that's the wrong interpretation, I'm sure you'll be able to tell me in the comments below. But Kef has a lot of information on that in their own YouTube page on their own website. So go and check that out. I'm not really going to get into the tech of what makes this speaker a reference meta model per se. I'm specifically going to focus on what I heard when I auditioned the speaker and how it performs objectively looking at data gathered from my Klippel near field scanner. This speaker doesn't go down to 20 hertz. It's not supposed to do that. Uh, in room, I think I measured it to about 40 hertz. I do have the F3 in the data, so we'll talk about that in a little bit. But I do want to make quick note here that this speaker comes with two different port options. By default, it comes with the long port. Now, this is just a foam port. Which you may think foam. Why would you use foam? That's garbage. No, it's not. This, this port does a really good job of keeping turbulence and vent resonances to a minimum. I heard none of that. None of that shows up in the data. The thing that I didn't like about the particular long port that came with this speaker is that the bass just didn't sound right in my room. Well, lo and behold, when I finally looked at the user's manual, I realized, oh, they give you a short port as well. And they say that if you use the long port, then you would use that when you put a speaker next to a wall. I didn't have that. I had the speaker way out from a wall. If you use the short port, then you put the speaker out into the room and it provides you a little bit more bass extension, which I really liked. And once I put that short port in, it really made a world of difference in my overall subjective assessment of the speaker. Now, I already thought it was good, but the bass just wasn't quite right. So when I put that short port in, that really helped things. And I'm saying all this to you so you understand that if you were to buy the speaker or even if you were to demo the speaker, make sure that you're cognizant of the port configuration because that really will make a difference. And it's actually quite easy to do that. And I'm going to show you, I will time lapse this a little bit, but I'm going to show you what I'm talking about here. So on the back, you have the port right here and then you have the multi-way binding posts. Uh, you got the low frequency and the high frequency. You can buy amp this just by turning this link section one way or the other. Now in my listening test, I did not buy amp the speaker. I just plugged it in as usual. As far as changing out the port though, let's see. Twist this, it unlocks, pull it out. So now you've got this little piece. Set this on top of here. And then I'm gonna slide out this other little port. So this is the short port. Let me show you them side by side. Having built numerous subwoofer boxes, usually when I play around with modeling subwoofers and things like that, I play around with the vent diameter, not so much the length and it, kind of escaped me just how much difference the length of the vent tube itself makes. Because when I looked at these side by side, I was like, yeah, that's not going to help, but it really did. And it does show up in the measurements. You will see that shortly. 
So for me to switch that back out, yeah, you just pop that out and then I'm gonna put this one back in so I don't forget it later. Slot it in. Press fit, and then you've got some little wings on the side, and you just turn it and lock it in place. Speaking of the manual, this does come with a nice little manual thing, packaging. It's kind of neat, you know? But the cool thing is when you open it up, yeah, you've got the normal manual. But this is the part that I thought was nice. Basically, this sheet is a graphic of the, uh, not, not calibration per se, but the response of the speaker itself. And what they do is, as they build the speaker, they put them in a little test chamber. And I've seen this video online, so that's how I know this. They put it in a little test chamber and they compare it to their reference version, right? So you have a quality control reference. And it's within one, what, one and a half? No, half a dB of tolerance, which is really good. That means that when you order a pair of speakers, they're basically matched. If you haven't built a speaker, if you haven't measured drivers, if you haven't measured speakers before, I don't know if half a dB really means anything to you. In an ideal world, the response of the two speakers is the exact same every single time. But in the real world, that's not what you get. And it's very common actually to see even just raw driving it. Say if I just take a raw mid-range or raw tweeter, for them to have a difference of about maybe plus or minus half a dB to a dB for very high-end, expensive, I'm talking like ScanSpeak, um, Seos, maybe even Purify, those kind of upper echelon of raw drive units, which I personally consider high tier, right? But on the lower end, I have measured $50 tweeters, $100 tweeters, mid ranges, et cetera, et cetera, with more of a divergence than that. I mean, you're looking at a DB, DB and a half, two DB. I mean, it's it can be terrible. Anyway, I'm getting off track. What I'm trying to say is a half a DB plus or minus with intolerance is great. That's really, really good for a passive speaker. Now, if this were an active speaker, they may be able to do better than that. But I will also say that a lot of active speaker designs will only tout within about half or, or plus or minus half a dB. So plus or minus half a dB for a passive speaker is really good. As far as my listening goes, I took a lot of notes. I listened to these speakers a lot of different times, upstairs in my home theater, downstairs in my living room. And I will say that when I moved the speakers from my home theater downstairs into my living room, I went back to the long ports to see if it helped because in my living room, the speakers were much more close to the wall. And in that case, I think it did help. I mean, I don't know for sure, but I think it did help. I didn't take the time to measure it, but it didn't sound um, not, not as good as it did when it was in my home theater upstairs. So in my home theater upstairs, when the speakers were pulled off from the back wall, the short port made a lot of difference for the better. And downstairs in my living room with the speakers closer to the wall, I can't really say that the long ports made that much of a difference. So again, I suggest that you try both. With all of that said, I'm actually just gonna flip through my notes over here that I printed out. And all of this will be found on my website, which is aaronsaudiocorner.com. I'll drop the link in the description below and you can go read about this later if you want to. All right, you with me, let's go. All listening was done in my home theater as well as my living room, which I already said. I used the Parasound Hint 6, which is like, I don't know, 200 and something watts at four ohms, I think, so it's plenty powerful. I will also mention that the speaker sensitivity, I measured it around 83 to 84 dB at 2.83 volts, one meter. So that's what I measured. And as far as volume goes, I don't feel like I had to turn them up higher than I normally do. Uh, but I will also say that as of late, some of the speakers that I have just demoed uh, within like the past few weeks, have been lower sensitivity speakers. So I was coming from already low sensitivity to a mid to low sensitivity speaker in this particular case. Now you may be wondering, is that a problem, right? Cause you think, well, when it's low sensitivity, uh, it doesn't have dynamics. It doesn't have low distortion. Well, that's not the case with this speaker. The data backs up everything I'm about to tell you, but I can tell you that in terms of dynamics, very low level volume level, Dynamics was really good. So I could listen to the speaker at around, for me, low volume is around 70 to 75. I could listen to the speaker at that low of a level and be happy. And in some cases, actually what I wound up doing was I plugged in my mini DSP into the uh, preamp portion and then boosted the low level or the low frequency area. I think around 30 to 50 Hertz, I gave it a cue of, I wanna say like two uh, on the parametric EQ, bumped it up about three dB, I think, and just listened to it at 
low to mid level and really enjoyed what I heard. But I will also say that if you plan to listen to these speakers at very high levels, uh, let's say like, I don't know, mid eighties to mid nineties, upper nineties at far distances, maybe like three to four meters, then you may want a subwoofer. And this is a little bit of a, a tough area because it really depends on what you're listening to. For the most part, I did not find myself necessarily wanting or needing a subwoofer, but there were a few tracks that are more bass heavy where I thought, you know, having some lower end extension or a subwoofer added to the system would probably help as well. So let's flip through some of my other notes. On axis response is surprisingly nice. And why do I say surprisingly nice? Well, the Kef R3, when I listened to that speaker, it was a little bit too bright. And the data actually backed up what I heard in my listening evaluations. And what I saw was the estimated in-room response had a slope down, but then I'm trying to remember, I think it was like five kilohertz or so, it kind of shelved off a little bit and there was a little bump in the high frequency and that was noticeable to me. Now with that in mind, I kind of half expected this speaker to maybe show the same kind of response curve because remember, I don't measure first, I always listen first. And I do that for a number of reasons, but I think it's pretty obvious why you would want to go that route. When I listened, I thought it's probably going to sound a little bit too bright based on my experience with some of the other Kef stuff where the, the upper end is a little bit boosted more to my liking. So what I started off with was the speaker toad off axis. So let's say that this is directly on axis, okay? Firing directly at, you can't see the side of the speaker at all. If I go a little bit off axis, maybe 10 degrees, maybe 15 degrees, something like that, that's what I thought would sound better. And when I did that, it sounded okay, but the highs weren't quite to my liking. I thought, well, I feel like I'm missing something. So then I actually wound up and turning it back on axis. Let's see if I can spin it back around. Yeah, pointed it directly toward my listening position, both speakers. And I was like, wow, this is really nice. So I was surprised. I wound up leaving it there. Extremely neutral. Nothing at all calls attention to itself. Symbols and hi-hats are sharp and detailed, but never shrilled. And there was no 5 to 8K harshness that I heard from other speakers that target the detailed sound. Now, a lot of speakers will try to target a detailed sound and they'll have an upper high frequency boost to give you that showroom impression of, oh man, that's super detailed. And it's got all the little details that I like and detail, detail, detail. And you take them home and then like, 20 minutes later, you're over it and your ears hurt and you don't want any more. <laughs> I've experienced that a, num a number of times, numerous, a number of times. And this speaker does not exhibit that to my ears and the data backs this up as well at all. So very good job there of this speaker having a nice tonally balanced response, at least in my opinion. One of the most 3D sound stages I've ever heard, the first thing that I noticed about the speaker, and maybe this is bias because my other experiences with KEF drivers and other good concentric designs is that the depths of soundstage was great with the speaker, but also the layering within the soundstage of, of images and uh, the focus as well, which everything was just like right where it should have been, at least based on my understanding of the of the tracks and having run it through some Sony SoundForge, Audacity, and Ozone Imager. With all that in mind, yeah, I think it's the I think I've got it currently number two as far as soundstage, and it's only bested by a $13,000, or maybe if it's even more, a set of X Machina Pulsar MK2 speakers, fully active studio monitor speakers. But I will say that the tonality of the speaker is much more to my liking than that particular speaker. So you've got trade offs there. Number one passive speaker that I've heard as far as soundstage goes. I mean, it's just to me, to me personally speaking, it's bar none. Now, how do I show that in the measurements? I don't know. Are we talking about vertical response versus horizontal? Uh, the fact that it's concentric, possibly, is it show up in the step response? These are things that I'm just not there yet, if I'm being honest with you. But audibly, best 3D soundstage I've heard out of a passive spare pair of speakers so far. Details just pop all over the place. So I wrote, Phil Collins, I don't care anymore. If you haven't heard that song, go out, listen to it make it one of your demo tracks on rotation. It's got panning drums, left and right, snare, uh, and really good kick drum as well. That song is awesome. And that song played on these speakers was fantastic. I already mentioned the really low level dynamics being good, very non-fatiguing, the compression and the distortion. So this speaker can get really loud, relatively speaking. Let's see here, I wrote, I've averaged about 98 dB on average, 98 dB, at three and a half meters. And the only reason I stopped is because I could tell that the port, or not the port, but the woofer was starting to reach its limits. And instead of having a full 
uh, formation of bass. It was just more like a thud at that volume level. But 98 dB is really, really loud. And I don't expect anybody to be listening to music at that kind of level on average. So the reason I do that is just to kind of push the speaker and see what its limits are. Because 98 dB at three and a half meters, if you're sitting within that region, that's crazy loud. But if you're sitting like really far away, then let's say you double that and you go to six meters or so, then you're closer to like 92 dB, you know, give or take. And so that level drops, but I don't really think that anybody's going to be pushing the speaker that hard. So as far as output volume goes, the distortion is very, very low and it's actually dangerously low because there is no distortion that I could hear in the mid range and the tweeter. The only signs that this speaker was starting to kind of give up, like I said, was that bass, that thump of that bass wasn't as dynamic, wasn't as full as I thought it should have been. It sounded a little bit compressed. And that's kind of how I knew that I was starting to run into the limits mechanically of the speaker. Uh, Bobby McFerrin's Don't Worry, Be Happy starts with a low vocal on the left. And that's another track. So all these tracks I listen to, I don't do like jazz audiophile music. I do what I consider like real music that I would listen to on the daily and I do listen to on the daily. And that's one of my favorite tracks. And you may be thinking, don't worry, be happy. Really, Aaron? I promise you, if you want a good sound quality track that's fun to listen to, listen to that track because Bobby McFerrin has all sorts of vocal tricks and things like that, which he's known for. A lot of cool stuff going on in that track and, and panning and things like that, but there's a low vocal that starts off on the left soundstage and it stays parked. And the cool thing about this particular speaker that it allowed me to, I guess, hear or visualize that I've, that I don't hear in other speakers and I do listen for it because I've heard it before. Um, is its ability to, it's almost like you can hear the pulsing of that vocal. And it's almost like you can see the pulsing of that vocal. And that's the only way I can think to describe something that sounds so ridiculous. But if you have the opportunity, listen to that track on a good set of speakers that has a good 3D soundstage and see if you notice that. But the fact that it stays parked and it pulses, like it's like I'm in the matrix. I can see these numbers coming through. I can see the sound waves. It's a trip. I loved it, loved it. Um, good solid kick on Depeche Modes, enjoy the silence. So my only gripe here, I'm, I'm saying all these great things, I've, I've got to throw you some kind of con, right? My only gripe here is that this speaker doesn't quite get as wide in soundstage as I would like. And you probably heard me say that a number of times and you're probably thinking, oh, this is just a trope now. Aaron just says it's about everything. That's not true. Uh, what is true is that a lot of speakers just don't get quite as wide as I want them to in terms of radiation. For me, wide in radiation would be maybe over like 50 degrees or so. And normally say like 70 degrees is kind of my point for, oh, this is awesome. It's very spacious sounding and enveloping almost. Uh, this speaker is about plus or minus 50 degrees, if I recall correctly. But it is wider in soundstage than the KEF R3, which is at about plus or minus 40 degrees in the horizontal. And that was noticeable to me. I did like that more. So it does have a wider soundstage. Now you can get more width by towing them out off axis. So just turning them a little bit more out. But when you do that, you're gonna lose some of that high frequency. But if you have EQ, this speaker takes very, very well to EQ. So you can bump up the high frequency a little bit more and get that back. That does it for my subjective notes. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go look at the objective data. And I'm gonna to try to hit the highlights for you because I know this section has run long. I'd be surprised if anybody stayed around for it this long. But I think the data is more important than me telling you what I heard because then I can relate why it is I heard what I heard and give you a better idea of what you can expect to hear and maybe how you can use these speakers in your room and maybe if it's a speaker for you based on some of the other data that we have and what you like, what you don't like about the data that will help you form a better opinion of whether or not you should buy the speaker. So with that said, let's go ahead and do that. Now, before I forget, I did receive these speakers from Kef on loan for review. I was not paid. Uh, Kef has not seen this video and did not see the data. They won't see any of it until it is released to the public. Also, before I keep going, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to this channel. Give this video a like if you liked it. Make sure you hit the notification bell for future videos so you can be alerted. So with that out of the way, let's go ahead and start talking about the data. The data was captured using my Clipple near field scanner. It is a state of the art robotic machine that allows you to get anechoic data in a non-anechoic environment, such as my garage, as you see in this video. And the reason for that being useful 
is it provides you an idea of how the speaker itself performs before you put it into a room. Now, the data can also give you an idea of how the speaker is going to sound in your room and in various rooms, but below about 500 hertz or so, the room dominates the response, and it's a good idea to have a good baseline for how the speaker performs without the room. And then you can also use this data to make adjustments via EQ if you'd like, or to come up with the best place to position the speaker in terms of height or on axis, off axis response linearity. The first data set we're gonna start with is the short port version. Now this is the one that I mentioned that I like the sound of more in my home theater room where the speaker was placed out from the wall. And when we compare it to the long port version, you'll see the difference more readily. But for now, what we're gonna look at is the on axis response and it's mostly smooth. Now we do see some deviations in the amplitude, but realistically speaking, these deviations are relatively minor in amplitude. We'll see a little bit more about this in the further graphics below. I also wanna go and point out that there is a directivity mismatch around the two kilohertz area, though it's pretty minor. I do find that interesting though, because typically when you see a directivity mismatch, it's normally because of the tweeter and the mid not being located in the same plane. Right, but this coincident speaker, the mid and the tweeter are right together. My guess is that this is probably some kind of diffraction effect vertically, but I won't know until we go and look at the data below in a little bit. So let's go back real fast and just focus on this low base area. And I'm going to tab down and go to the long port measurement response. And you can see here that there is a difference. Now the long port is probably more neutral in the base where the short port has a little bit of a bump up in it, right? But the long port, once it hits about 60 Hertz or so, this, this area right here, you can see it kind of flattens out a little bit. Well, I guess maybe it kind of plateaus a little bit and then it falls off a little bit more quickly. Whereas the short port version has a more gradual slope, I guess, and then it starts to fall off. So I think it kind of just depends on what your room setting is and maybe what your preference is. Again, I do recommend that you try both now, this is the estimated in-room response for the short port. And look how linear this is. The only deviation that's even worth mentioning is this right through here around the one kilohertz area. But that's about maybe a half a dB or so if I were to take a line and draw an average trend line through here. And this is with the speaker aimed on axis. All my measurements were done with the microphone placed at the tweeter level. This is superb. I mean, out of the box, this is great. This is one of the best responses I've seen to date out of the box without EQ. And this is actually the one that I like the most. If I go to the long port version, we can see that the base is shelved up a little bit more. Again, you've got this little kind of a, a weird roll off thing. You know, it's kind of like an extended base port version. Uh, but otherwise, above the base area, the trend line is pretty much the same. So now we go and look at the horizontal response. So as you go on axis to off axis, how does the response tend to fall? Is it more uniform or is there some significant uh, deviation from the on axis response? And we see that it's pretty dang uniform throughout. I mean, even 90 degrees just kind of floats along through here. There's no significant aberrations where maybe as you go 30 degrees off axis, there's no strong peak relative to the on axis response. And then if we kind of go through here and try to look at the one kilohertz area to explain this, you know, I'm honestly just not seeing it in here. I'm not seeing really any differentiation between here, unless maybe I look at 800 hertz where it's a little bit more bunched up and then it starts to spread out right through here. But I'm just not sure that it's from the horizontal response. So let's go look at the vertical. And in the vertical, I'm really still not seeing it here as well. So I think in the estimated interim response, what we are seeing with this dip is really just strictly due to the on axis response and, and the off axis responses behave the same, which means then that you could EQ that dip up if you wanted to. Personally speaking, I didn't have any issues with the tonality of the speaker at all. And any EQ adjustments that I made playing around with the speaker were just on the base to give me some extra reinforcement so I wouldn't have to have a subwoofer at lower volume. So now let's look at the horizontal response and we can see a really good directivity and it's not constant. And when I say constant, what I mean is the angle would be the exact same throughout. So it would stay at 60 degrees or 70 or 50 or something like that. But in the mid range, you're actually out to about plus or minus 60. And then in the higher frequency is when you start to taper down into plus or minus 50. So when I said plus or minus 50 earlier, 
compared to the KEF R3 at plus or minus 40. Well, this is really what I was talking about. But truthfully, if I'm looking at the data in the mid range, it's about plus or minus 60. So what I think we have here is a purposely tapered high frequency response so that you don't have a bright estimated in-room response. And this also correlates back to the very mildly tapered on axis response, which I'll show you in a second. Now let's go look at the vertical response. And this thing is pretty much uniform throughout. Uh, just very, very good vertical response that I'm seeing here. And here we have the impedance and phase. Uh, EPDR is at 1.8 ohm minimum. So if you were looking at the impedance from the EPDR standpoint, then you hit about 1.8 ohms. If you look at impedance just from impedance itself, not factoring in the phase relationship, then the impedance dips to about 2.9 hertz. And I'm calling out above 80 hertz. And the reason I do that is because I'm trying to make all my data uh, relatable throughout, so apples to apples. And most of the speakers that people are using are going to wind up being crossed over. If you don't plan to cross the speaker over with a subwoofer, then obviously you'll need to go in and look a little bit more on your own. But in general terms, people are going to cross over above maybe like 80 hertz. So I just call out 80 hertz for that particular reason. Like I said, though, I used this speaker with the Parasound Hint 6. Listen at very high volume for the para speakers. No issues at all. So a good 4 ohm stable amplifier should have no problem driving these speakers. Now we come to the response linearity. And remember, I was saying that we've got some dips through here and we got some peaks and some dips, right? And it's kind of bouncing around. So if you look at it from that perspective, you're thinking, wow, it's not perfectly flat. But look up here. On average, it's about 82.5 dB. And it's about, what is that? Plus or minus, just in general, we'll say plus or minus one and a half dB from 80 hertz to 16 kilohertz. That's really dang good. That's completely passive speaker. No active DSP included at all. And I think that's something to write home about. You'll notice also that the high frequency is tapered down just a little bit, maybe like a half a dB gradual slope compared to around the one and a half kilohertz region. The reason I'm pointing that out is because this combined with this gets you this for the most part. There is some vertical radiation factored in. Let's look at the distortion. Distortion at 86 dB you're below 1% down to about 70 hertz. I mean, you're below, I don't even know, these are fractions of a percentage down here in the mid-range. It's crazy low. At 96 dB, you're below 1% up into about 150 hertz, and you're below 3% into about 70 hertz. So again, this speaker is very, very low distortion. But what does it do in terms of linearity as you turn the volume up? Really solid performance, especially in the high frequency. There is no deviation in the high frequency, which means that crossover components or voice coil heating up, none of those things are factoring into this speaker as you listen to it at higher output levels compared to lower volume levels. And that means that you're gonna have really good dynamic range. And that's what I heard when I was listening to the speaker. That does it for this video. I do appreciate you watching. As I said, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing. If you are interested, please consider joining my Patreon. That helps me fund some of the projects that I'm doing. And that would be really, truly greatly appreciated. And with that said, I am out. I hope you all appreciate it. Hope you all have a great one. And yeah. Okay. Take care. Peace.